Welcome to the Fit Dad Nation podcast, forging strong fathers and raising a stronger generation. It's time to get up or shut up with your host, Steve Roy. Hey guys, this is Steve Roy, host of the Fit Dad Nation podcast. Welcome to the show. Thanks for listening. Um, So uh, before I introduce today's guest, I want to take a quick moment to invite all of you dads who are listening right now, if you're ready to start taking action on reclaiming your health and fitness, which will in turn help you become a better father, a better husband, a better man, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff uh, in our groups. Um, and we have right now we have a, um, a private Facebook group. It's a free private Facebook group called the Fit Dad Base Camp. Um, a very uh, engaged uh, group there. We're doing a lot of uh, stuff that's helping a lot of men. You can apply there at fitdadnation.com forward slash community. <clears throat> so my guest today, his name is Joe Buckner. Um, he's actually somebody I met in our community a few years ago. Um, he was recently out of uh, a relationship and going through some personal struggles. And then we kind of lost touch for a while. And then I started seeing his name popping up online in my feeds. And as it turns out, he was just super busy busting his ass. He opened a, a boxing studio. He started speaking around the country, sharing his message and hustling after his passion for helping people. So he's the owner of the Beautifully Savage Boxing Studio in Fort Collins, Colorado. He's also a coach, an entrepreneur, a TEDx speaker, and he's on a mission to teach others how to fight their own internal battles through self-reflection, dedication, and persistence. Uh, and he's actually been extremely difficult to pin down, so I'm super happy to have you here. Thanks, Joe. Uh, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, man, of course, of course. So we were just chatting a little bit before we started recording, and yeah, we've been trying to get this uh, on the books for, it has to be at least a year. Um, and you are, seriously, you must be one of the busiest guys I know. Every time I see your feed, see you on Facebook or, or Instagram, you know, you're traveling, you're sharing your message, you're on stage, you're shooting videos, there's a movie about you like you have a, a crazy story and you're you're hustling I, I love everything about your story and so you know maybe we can just start kind of you know uh, from the beginning I guess because there's so much I want to get into with you yeah for sure um just you want a little background on yes, me or yes what, absolutely what? yeah so I'm Joe Buckner <clears throat> I live in a place called Fort Collins Colorado I am um the owner of a place called Beautifully Savage Boxing Studio. I'm a father, um, friend, son, brother, and uh, entrepreneur, speaker, ambassador for brands like Lululemon, uh, York Athletics, Cali Active Boxing Gloves, Formula, Nootropics. And uh, I am just blessed that people even want to hear my story. Um, I'll give you the elevator pitch version of it because the real version of it's kind of long. But, you know, grew up a five sport athlete in high school, lettered in five varsity sports. I was all state in two of them and played college football and then got into a career in sales. And then a few years later decided that that wasn't providing me with the life that I wanted. So I started doing things that are considered antisocial, um, things like selling drugs. And, um, Mm. that ultimately led me to where it leads all people that do that to being sent to the Department of Corrections. By the grace of God, I was able to go to a boot camp program run by ex-military personnel, Army and Marines, that absolutely changed my life. I came home in 2006 and worked my butt off to never go back to that place ever again, put my life back together. And then circa 2013, I was homeless for roughly seven months here in the city that I was once a star. Um, but from that, you know, I'd, I'd learned so much about myself prior that I was able to pull myself back up off the mat and then, you know, become two years later, I was a six figure earner at one of the top copier companies in the country. And then a year after that, I opened beautifully savage in June of 2016. And I used that space to encourage people to fight for their life the same way that I fought for mine. Yeah, so obviously there's a lot of a lot in there, um, a lot of questions. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the transition. Obviously, you know, you start making poor decisions, you hang out with the wrong crowd, you start doing illegal stuff. You you know, you get caught, you end up in jail. <clears throat> so, you know, I've I've seen your movie, I've watched some of your stuff. Um, it's very emotional, and so you know, I want to hear. I guess, I mean, maybe we start 
at, at the moment where you get caught, right? And you realize that, okay, I have kids and I'm headed to jail. I mean, so that that is my like nightmare is like getting wrongly convicted of something and going to jail and, and losing that. Like that yeah. terrifies me because it, that shit does happen, right? People do get wrongly convicted, you know. So, yeah. You know, so like those things terrify me. But you, you know, you actually went to jail. So <clears throat> I want to hear, you know, what happened, what was going through your mind when, you know, you got busted and realized, shit, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jail. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I guess I have to preface that by saying that I was the wrong crowd. Uh, I didn't hang out with the wrong crowd. I was a part of the wrong crowd. I'd been going to jail consistently two or three times a year for 10 years, um, you know, whether it was for committing crimes or not following through on probation or whatever supervision they had me on. So I actually was the wrong crowd. Um, and so for me, I think that that journey was inevitable. Being away from them for two, three months at a time was just something that I'd grown accustomed to because I think after we've lived our life a certain way for a certain amount of time, we start to believe that narrative, right? Whatever we've told ourselves. And so I'd convince myself that I was a bad dude who did bad things. And the consequences of that is sometimes you're in jail. And so in September of 2005, when I did get sent to prison, um, I got sentenced to five years. And I had to call my children and I remember my little girl crying in the phone and saying, Daddy, but why do you have to be gone for so long? And I didn't have an answer. And so I made a promise. I said, I can't make many promises, baby girl, but I'm going to promise you this. I'll be home as soon as I can. I'll do whatever I have to. I'll toe the line. I'll change my ways. I'll do whatever I have to do to get home to you. And again, by the grace of God, I went to this boot camp program that wasn't a guarantee. Um... And I was home 10 months later. So it was one of the probably worst days of my entire life calling my children and telling them that they weren't going to see me potentially for five years. Man, were you, were you married at the time? No, uh, their mom and I had been together for eight and a half years prior. Okay. Um, I, was, I was single at the time though. Okay. Okay. So what happened to the kids? Oh, I mean, they were with their mom. They just stay with her and yeah. did that create? Yeah, we had shared 50-50 custody through our whole relationship So until the kids were 18. So, Did that create any legal issues like, okay, now your dad's a dirtbag and he's in jail, so I'm just going to basically take full custody of the kids? And, you know, did, did that happen? No, nobody's blameless. You know, if she mm -hmm. was in a relationship with me for eight years at a certain point, you know what's going on. So you can't be blameless, you know. Um, mm -hmm. She was actually really supportive. You know, she made sure that they wrote me letters. I would call them every Sunday and talk with them um, for the total of 15 minutes that you're allowed to use the phone. Um, you know, she helped me out as much as she could. When I came back, she never kept the children from me. She and I have always had a fantastic relationship when it came to co-parenting our children. We were children when they were born. I was 21 and she was 19 when our first daughter was born. Um, so we kind of grew up together and we just always understood like these kids need both of us. And, mm -hmm. you know, it all came full circle because a few years after I came home, she ended up having some bouts with addiction and homelessness and she left for two years and we didn't hear from her at all. And the kids were with me full time. So in, in that time, I was able to extend the same kindness to her when she came back home and called from Denver and I was able to pick her and her boyfriend up and take them to a shelter and then give them money to get into an apartment because I'd already fixed my life. So We've always just had a fantastic relationship. And I think that a lot of it came from the fact that I, from a young age, just kind of understood that even if I'm not together with their mom, I have to love their mom openly and let them see that because I'm setting an example for my daughter and for my son of how a man's supposed to treat, you know, the mother of his children who at one point he probably loved. So, yeah, no, she didn't. There was no legal issues around that. She was great. And uh, I'm glad that I was able to return that kindness to her one day. Wow. Yeah, you don't hear that often. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. It's And it's very hard because I've worked with many single dads and very few, you know, are able to look past, you know, the personal issues that they have and anger and bitterness and all that stuff and respect their mother and show that in front of the kids. So 
that's awesome, man. So you know, I have such a hard time, you know, thinking of you in that environment because every every time I've ever seen you in this last you know number of years, you know, you're you're dressed sharp. You've got a business. I mean, you're very well spoken. You're a smart guy or a good looking dude. You have a lot going for you. Like it's so hard for me to think that you know, ten years prior, you know, you were just this kind of guy doing all the wrong things and on the streets and then in jail and. It's, it's just such a turnaround. Um, it's amazing, man. I mean, you don't see that often. And, and you know the stats probably better than I do, but, you know, the, the the odds of somebody coming out of a lifestyle like that, going to jail, and then coming out, and then turning it around like you have, are pretty slim. Um, yeah. You know, probably really slim. And 75% so go back within the first three years. That's crazy. I mean, that, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. And you chose just the opposite. And and for those of you listening, you know, look at his stuff, you know, go to Dodo, his channels um, and just look through his stuff um, because I mean, you've got your shit together. Like most, you know, I, I don't see that very often in a space. Um, and your, your message is so positive. I mean, I just made a decision. Right. And, and you, you, I'm sure you talk about this with the people that you work with is that we're always one decision away from a different life. And so, you know, I had some pivotal moments when I was locked up. I mean, it was only 10 months, but it was 10 of the most transformative moments of my life. Um, but one of them was when an old timer pulled me to the side and, you know, he ran through a bunch of things with me and basically broke it down to me that everything had been stripped away from me, my identity, my name, the only thing that I still had was my ability to choose. And he said, and every day you get to decide if you're the kind of person that wants to come back here or if you never want to come back and no one can ever take that from you. And that was the first time in my life anybody had really told me that I get to choose the life that I want. I just sort of always felt like we just had to deal with whatever was happening. Right. And so it's crazy to think that the person that I am now, the opportunities that I have now, the business that I'm involved in, the lives that I get to impact by speaking and doing these other things never happen if I don't have that conversation in prison with that man. I'm, I probably I might be dead at this point. You know, I might have done something worse to where I'm in prison for the rest of my life. So um, I'm forever grateful to him. I don't even know his name. We had this one conversation and that was it. But, you know, it wasn't. It hasn't been easy. I mean, I appreciate the fact that you feel like I have my stuff together. I think for the most part I do, but I'm a regular dude. You know, I still pay some bills late sometimes. Last night I ate like 12 Starbursts. Um, so, That's you know, right. I have a, I got, I've got all the regular things that other people do, but I don't know. I just feel that those of us, like you've got a great platform. I've been blessed with a small platform. Like, we have this opportunity to really impact people and we can be a positive impact or we can be a negative. And I spent a lot of my life being a negative impact on everybody that I came into contact with. So now I get to do the opposite and I'm leaning into that full force. Wow. So you have this conversation, you come out, you, you've made a decision to make a change. And so like, what's the first thing you do? I mean, do you start hustling, trying to, get a life together? I mean, do you have a plan at this point? I mean, when does, when does boxing come into play and, and yeah. does, does it start there? No. Nah, so I got out in uh, April, April 13th, 2006 is when I got out and I knew I was going to a halfway house. I'd specifically asked to go to a halfway house. They were going to put me on probation because I'd done so well in the boot camp program. They're going to just let me free. And I begged them to send me to a halfway house. I said, you know, I know myself, and I'm on the right path now, but if you put me out there and I just have freedom, give me a chance to fight for my life. Put me in a halfway house where I don't have to make decisions out of desperation. And I remember the lieutenant laughing and saying, like, man, nobody ever asks to go to the halfway house and not probation. And I was like, well, I'm asking. And so they sent me to a halfway house. And then I only had one job at that point. My job was to find a job because – I'd changed. The man that I was had changed. Mm -hmm. And I knew that all I needed was people to see me. So I didn't care what the job was. If people could see me and see how I showed up every day, eventually that job making bagel sandwiches would turn into a different job. And that job would turn into a different job. They were just opportunities to be seen all the way up to, you know, 
10 years later, opening my boxing studio. So, you know, it was a, I took two $7 an hour jobs when I was in the halfway house. I used to walk 14 miles every single day between those jobs. Um, and like I said in my film, every day that I'd wake up at 2.30 in the morning to walk, I'd be so grateful just to have the ability to walk out in fresh air in my own clothes. And sometimes it was cold and sometimes it was raining. But man, it's a lot better than being locked in a room with another dude for 23 hours a day. No disrespect to anybody that I was ever locked in a room with. If you were one of those people, mm -hmm. God bless you. I hope you're doing good. But man, mm -hmm. nothing compares to freedom, you know. And so um, I just... I just set out, man, when I, before I got let loose, I remember I would talk to people and I'd say, I don't care what the opportunity is. If I need to work at Taco Bell, I will work at Taco Bell, but I promise you this, within 90 days, I'll be running that place. Promise. And sure enough, I took a job at a bagel shop in a calzone place. Within 60 days, I got offered the general manager job at the bagel shop. And then, you know, a year later, I took a job at a place called Aaron's rent to own company. Mm -hmm. I took anything they had. They had a nine dollar an hour job making coffee and vacuuming floors. Three weeks later, I was the sales manager. Five months later, I was the general manager. A year later, I was the regional manager of a 22 store franchise. And, you know, I haven't really looked back since. Wow. I guess, uh, I mean, we, we all know that, you know, we hear the, the term hustle a lot, you know, hustle, hustle, hustle. And it sounds like that's how you lived, right? I mean, you're just going to create something for yourself. And I don't, you know, I don't see that enough. I mean, you know, we, we obviously, you know, that we're kind of in an entitled society and people want things handed to them. And if you go out to a restaurant, you go out to a retail place, half the time, it's someone that could care less about their job and just looking to do as little as possible. So I love that you've just flipped that on its end and just done, you know, swallowed your pride gone after it you know and just hustled your ass off and yeah obviously it paid off a lot yeah yeah and um i mean i love i love that you recognize that it's funny um so i'm trying to make sure that i word this correctly i actually have an instagram tv video that's getting set to go up about hustling um because I, I've been thinking about that term a lot and it's been used to describe me so much throughout my life. And uh, somebody broke it down for me a few weeks ago. I was just talking with a gentleman just randomly and I was like, you know, I hustle, hustle, hustle. And he was like, do you think people want to be hustled or do they want to be served? And I was like, what? He's like, I understand what you're saying, Joe, but like if you've moved through your whole life as a hustler, then you always feel like you're hustling and that doesn't ever stop. So maybe focus on serving. And I was like, interesting. Hmm. So I've always used it like you're using it. Like I just work hard. I just mm -hmm. go after it. But it's interesting, like mm -hmm. just even how we can take one little word and flip it on its head and it means something totally different. And so what what is that saying, right? When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So just from that one conversation with him, like I've completely stopped referring to myself as that because I promise you, if you come to my town and ask someone about me, they'll be like, oh, that dude's a hustler. Like he's a hustler, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, dang, I never thought that maybe some people might look at that in a negative way. Like, okay, I don't want to be hustled. Like I'd like to maybe collaborate with you or work with you, but I don't want to be hustled, right? So – um, I, I just wasn't going to be uh, – just to go back to the question about my life, I refused to be denied. And I used to say to everybody I'd interview with, you don't have to give me a job, but I can promise you, you're going to wish you did. You're going to see me someplace somewhere working and be like, man, I wish I would have given that guy a job. So um, – that's just how I approached everything. And that's kind of still how I approach everything. Like I have a, a bolder size chip on my shoulder and it all has to do with the fact that I put myself at a disadvantage, you know, at 30 years old coming out of prison with four felonies, my back was against the wall. So I had to fight and scrap for every little thing. And, uh, so far it's working out pretty good. Um, <laughs> yeah, not great all the time, but it's working out. Okay. Yeah, so so you had these jobs, right? So at Aaron's and, and um, the bagel yeah. shop, and and so it was after this that you became homeless. Was this like during yep. a, after a breakup? Is that is that what kind of spurred yep. it? Yep, yep, yeah. So um, my little girl, her mom, and I were living together, and 
one day she just told me I, I don't want to live together anymore. We were engaged. And um, I thought, well, that stinks because we made this deal that you could stay home with the baby. I would work and provide for us. And I just paid all the bills. So I actually don't have any money to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she made a generous offer. She said, my grandma said she'll give you a check for the rent. And I was like, well, the rent's part of it. And my pride didn't take the check. Hindsight, I should have taken the check. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> but I also wanted to work on my relationship. I wanted to fight for it. And it didn't end up working out. And yeah, I ended up on the streets. And again, it's all just a matter of like mindset, right? Even when I was on the streets, I would scrape scrape money together, doing odd jobs for people because I'd already left errands for another job opportunity that didn't end up panning out. So I would do whatever I had to do to get the $47 I needed to stay at a Motel 6 from time to time, or I would sleep at the parking ride in my car when it was nice enough. But whenever I'd be at the Motel 6, because I'd call and you know check on my kids every night just to make sure they were okay, um, let them know I was okay, and you know my friends and people would say, you know, well, where, where are you going to be at tonight? And I'd say, well, I'm going to be at the mansion. <laughs> and they'd say, the mansion? I thought you were at the Motel 6. I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, but There's 48 rooms, a swimming pool, and a Waffle House. So it kind of sounds like a mansion to me. So I prefer to call it the mansion. And people, I remember my daughter wrote me a letter for my birthday a couple years ago, and she referenced that. She said, I, the one thing that I admire most about you is that you always stay positive even when things are hard. And I know it sounds hokey, and you know it to be fact. And, but when we talk to people, they probably think it sounds hokey, but like, your mindset and the way that you choose to wake up every day and move through this world will directly affect how you shape the world around you. So I could have been negative and sad and down like, oh, I'm homeless, blah, blah, blah. But every day I was like, I'm going to figure this out because I've been worse than this. This is not a maximum security prison where I have been. I've been worse than this. So I'm going to figure this out. And so I did. It took me about seven months, but I figured it out. Wow. So – how did that all transition into ultimately you taking up boxing and and you know then starting your own studio? Yeah, I've been boxing since I was six, so okay. boxing's always been a thing for me. My uncle Tony taught me that at a very young age. Um, but you know, I'm 44 years old, so growing up there wasn't any boxing scholarships, and I needed to find a way to go to college. So football it was. Um, I. When I was homeless, I have a friend whose name was Trevor who helped me out a bunch. And he had a business and he was involved in this networking group that he didn't want to go to. And so he would tell me like, hey, I'll pay you a little bit of money if you go sit at this three hour networking group every Wednesday. And by the way, they have like free breakfast. And so for me, it was win win, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm going to get to eat and I get to be inside for a little while. Cool. But I also, again, I'm playing chess, right? I'm also thinking, okay, if there's 60 people in there, someone in there is going to see me show up in a suit every week and help me get to an opportunity. So I need to use this platform, again, for people to see me. So I'd show up in my suit every week, you know, maybe different shirt or something, but same suit, sharp. Nobody needs to know that I'm homeless, right? I don't need to walk in and lead with, oh, hey, I'm homeless. I just show up show up, do my thing. And one day, um, I also had to change what I was asking for, right? Call it what you want. God, universe, law of attraction, quantum physics, the secret. It's all the same. It's all this vibration that's listening to you all the time, in my opinion. And so I, like a lot of people, was asking for success. Oh, make me successful. Make me rich. Oh, give me all the things, right? Mm -hmm. I stopped asking for that. And I said, I need an opportunity, but it has to be the right opportunity. It can't be $7 an hour again. I need to get my kids back with me. I need to provide for them in the way that they deserve. So here's what I need. And I asked for this every day. I would write it down. I need a job that has a salary. I would like it to have commissions and bonuses because I'm really good. I've been in sales for a long time. I know how to work with people and help them get what they want. I would love if it had benefits so me and my children can go to the dentist and go to the doctor and not have to worry about paying for that out of pocket. And I would like it to have a car allowance because my car is about to get repossessed. So um, I wrote that down. I still have the note card that I wrote it down on. This was, you know, 13 years ago. No, this was uh, six years ago. 
I wrote it down and I would write it every day. This is what I need. This is what I want. This is what I want. And one day a guy stood up in the group. Named, he announced his name was Heath Kastendike. And uh, Heath says, I need a salesperson. It has this salary, commissions and bonuses paid monthly, $350 a month car allowance, full benefits, and our biggest client is the Denver Broncos. <laughs> and I remember I marched right over to Heath and I was like, I'm the guy. You don't even have to look. You don't have to interview anybody else. I'm the guy. Three weeks later, I had that job, took my first paycheck, got an apartment for me and my kids. The first year, I just kind of muddled through trying to figure my way through it, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. And about month 13, I just hit my stride. And then I started making that money that people say they want to make, you know, 8000 a month, 12000 a month, 15000 a month, culminating in June 2015. This is not a flex. I'm just sharing my journey. In June 2015, I made $55,000 in sales commission. That's like as much money as most people would be happy to make in their salary. Mm -hmm. And I remember that day I went out in the grass and I laid down and I cried. I just cried. And I was the top salesperson in that office at that time. So all the other young new people came outside and they're like, why are you crying? I said, I mean, you don't know what I've been through to get here. You don't know the road that I've taken. You don't know how many doors I knocked on. I cold called until there was holes in my shoes, um, until the soles were worn off. I knocked on doors. I called people on the phone in the rain, in the snow, just to get to this point. And I'm never going to turn back. So... That was in 2015. A year later, I decided that, you know, while making $100,000 is cool, it's not nearly as much as what I provided. You know, I did the math. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I'm an up and down the street rep, and I did $1.2 million in revenue last year, which is a lot considering the average sale is $6,000. Wow. And I got paid 14% of that money. My boss said, yeah, that's a lot of money. I was like, yeah, but you guys got 86% of my efforts. Mm-hmm of me going out there working every day, blood, sweat, tears. So maybe if I do a third of that for myself, I'll be okay. I'll be all right. Mm -hmm. So I opened my gym June 2016. Wow. So, <clears throat> so you open the gym, right? And then you start – spreading your message, right? You start posting on social, you start getting attention and you end up doing a TEDx talk. I mean, how did that come about? And so I want to hear, it's called Fighting Solves Everything. So I want to hear about like how it came about and then what that means, well, yeah. what, what, what it means to you. Yeah. So the event was called TEDx Arena Circle. It was at the University of Northern Colorado in September, 2016. Um, unfortunately, for some reason, the presenter, the guy that was putting it on, didn't get it uploaded by YouTube because there's like a lot of channels you have to go through to get, I mean, by Ted to get it uploaded. But I have it on my phone, actually. My girl, my ex fiance recorded it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to share it with people, but I don't know. Anyways, um, that came about just from me sharing and someone referred me. Someone that I've never even met in my life said, hey, you got to check this dude out. The guy started looking through my channels and reached out to me and said, would you be interested in doing this? And I thought, well, Sure. I'll do it. Yeah. Like, that's fine. You know, <clears throat> and Ted is, you know, there's, their saying is ideas worth sharing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I thought, well, I could share my story, which is fine, but my story is really about fighting. It's about someone who is either too arrogant or too naive to just give up even when it looks like he probably should. So, like I said earlier, everything I've ever lost has claw marks on it. So, I know how to fight. But I also understand that the traits that make someone a good fighter are traits that will make you successful in life in any endeavor. So, I did a lot of research and, um, you know, came up with what I believed were the top five traits of a champion fighter and wove them into a talk called Fighting Solves Everything. And I tried to get people to take a word that is usually considered negative, fighting, mm -hmm. and get them to see it as something that is necessary. Because at a certain point, every one of us has to fight, right? Whether we go through a breakup, 
um, whether we want more time with our children, whether we get 40 pounds overweight or depression or we lose our job or at some point life's going to knock you on your butt and it's going to ask you to fight back. And so that's the point where we either stand up and fight or we cut and run. All I know is how to fight. And so that's what I try to teach people now. So that's that talk was the start of that ethos of my gym of fighting solves everything. And we teach people how to fight for everything they want in their life. Yeah, that's a great metaphor. You know, when you hear that, you think, oh, you know, fist fighting. But you're talking about in the grand scheme of things, you know, just fighting for what you want. Um, that's big. So. So you're following your passion, and I mean, I see a lot of a lot of guys. I mean, I've been around a lot of dads over the last five years, six years, and I see a lot of men settle, especially guys our age, right? I'm 48, and so you know, a lot of us just get stuck in these lives we don't necessarily want, right? We feel, kind of feel trapped, and then you're kind of going through the motions of life, kind of apathetic towards you know what you have in your life, and just every day is coming and going. You're living for the weekends and to me, that's one of the worst things, how you could spend your life. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a tragedy. And so when I see you, and you know, I feel the same way because you know, I'm pursuing what I love. But when I see you, you know, you could have gone a million different directions, but you went after something that is important to you. And, you know, I just I love seeing that. And I love seeing the the realness of you. You know, because social media is a bunch of bullshit, you know, for the most part. There's so much fake crap on there, you know, and, and that's one of the biggest issues I have with social. I, I have a pro- – I don't, I don't actually like it. I, I wish I didn't have to do it, but, you know, being an online business owner, yeah, I do it. <clears throat> but, you know, you're just sharing your story. You're being honest. You're being vulnerable, and there's so much power in that. I think that's one of the reasons why you have so much attention and you've done so well is because you're not afraid to share – you know, what really happened. And and that is what changed people's lives. And when people see that and they can resonate with that, that's when, that's when you can start helping other people instead of, you know, flashing your abs, like in my business. And, you know, I can do 25 pull-ups and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, who cares about that stuff? It's, it's so much bigger than that. Um, and so <clears throat> that's why just looking at your stuff is, it's so inspiring because I know you are helping just a lot of people. Thank you. For sure. So, you know, I, so you're, you've been fighting your whole life, right? I mean, actually, so, so boxing your whole life. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I'm curious to hear about because I was bullied as a kid. I was like the, the literally like the 98 pound weakling all through high school. I was bullied. I, I had a bad experience and it lasted for a long time. Like I had a really negative experience in middle school and high school. Um, really bad for me. Um, and I was always a coward. Like I was afraid of these other kids and I was living in terror. Like I spent, I think it was eighth grade. I spent the whole year basically crying myself to sleep, thinking I was going to get beaten up the next day by this kid, Roger, who would always tell me, you know, you're dead. And, you know, <clears throat> and so that's one thing that I've always carried around with me and, and, you know, wanting to get past that you know like getting to a point where where you're not backing down um and so you know you know you say you can learn a lot by getting punched in the face and you know i got punched in the face once and it was by my brother and i was like just in shock like what just happened and you know i backed off instead of you know doing anything else you know and i think it, it says a lot about you and how you handle adversity and so is that kind of what you're teaching along oh obviously you're teaching boxing skills or how you know the 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 science of an art of boxing but are you teaching people i mean does it really kind of um manifest itself in other areas how you react in a fight you know how you control yourself how you know those types of things because yeah when you get punched in the face hard you know you stars are circling and you're like you know, what am I supposed to do now? Right. Yeah. So is that, is that, is that kind of something that you have conversations with, with your, with your clients and your members? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm like, I'm sitting over here 
listen to your story and I'm like, man, I wish me and you would have been friends. Me and Roger would have had a conversation. Because mm-hmm. like, um, I was the opposite kid. Like if somebody said they were going to beat me up, I'd be like, when? <laughs> Yeah. Like we need to figure this out because what we're not going to do is say that we're going to do something to somebody that we're not going to do. Um, but that's just the family I was brought up in. I come from a family of fighters. I mean, if you ask people in my town about my family, they'll tell you about the adults, especially like my mom, her brother, sisters. They're like, that's a, that's a tough group. Like those people fight. Hmm. And so that physicality has been in me my whole life. And then, you know, being a football player, like, I hate to say it this way, um, but I'll bring it around so I don't sound like such a jerk. But like violence was a way of life for me, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, even in my home. I mean, you you didn't get many opportunities to explain before you got smacked. You know, that's just how I was brought up. Now, as an adult parent, I understand now that hitting kids makes them afraid of you. It doesn't actually make them listen or respect you. But that's all I knew. So growing up, it's like, okay, well. You don't just say something to me and not expect some type of response, especially if you're threatening me with physical harm. I can say, honestly, I've never had someone in my life say they were going to beat me up, not at any age. When I was a sophomore in high school, I heard this dude named Tim Pittman said it. And mind you, Tim Pittman was a kid. Like every town has like three or four kids that people are like, yo, that's a bad dude, Mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Tim was one of those dudes and he was a senior at our school. And I remember someone told me, hey, uh, we're at this thing, man. Tim Pittman said he was going to beat you up. I was like, really? I'd never met Tim Pittman in my life, but God decided to put us both together in the senior hall alone like four days later. And I remember I walked up to Tim Pittman. I was like, hey, did you really say you were going to beat me up? And now, mind you, he might have just mopped the floor with me that day. I don't know. But he was like, no, nah, man, I never said that. And I was like, oh. Okay. And then we went about our way, right? <laughs> and I remember I told that story to some kids and they're like, Are you crazy? I was like, nah, I just that doesn't sit well with me. Like we we we'll figure it out. You might win, I might win, but we'll figure it out. And so fighting is all I know, right? Mm-hmm. So in the gym, what I wanted to do with the gym is like boxing is just the tool that I use to teach people about themselves, right? I energize people. That's what I do. And so boxing is a great way to do it. It's an awesome full body workout, but there's also so many parallels between boxing and life that I can use. I can say, hey, who's the greatest fighter of all time? And unanimously, people will say Muhammad Ali. You might have one yahoo say Mike Tyson Mm -hmm. or something, but most people globally will say Muhammad Ali. And I can say, okay, Muhammad Ali does not own one record in boxing not the most knockouts, not the most wins, like nothing. Mm -hmm. People always say he's the greatest because they knew that he was willing to fight for everything in and out of the ring. I said, but if he's the greatest fighter of all time, you can Google Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier or Ken Norton or Leon Spinks and you'll see Muhammad Ali getting beat up, laid on his back, knocked down. But people loved him because he always got back up to fight. So if the greatest fighter of all time can get knocked down, so can you. What are you going to do about it? And so the way that it's translated in our place, I'll tell you a great story about a young lady. Um, Her name is Anna Asernia. She's one of our first members. She was a dancer. She had just moved back from China, and she just wanted to try boxing. She came in. Her first class was with me by herself um, because I had no money for marketing or advertising. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was slim pickings in the beginning three years ago. And um, anyhow, year after working out with us, she comes in one day and she says, um, can I tell you something? I said, sure. She said, I have two stories to tell you. She said, first, I finally applied to law school. I've been putting it off for five years. But since I've been coming here, I have the confidence to do it. And I, I got in. I'm going to law school. And I was like, oh, congratulations. That's that's rad. She said, but wait, I have one more story. She said, I went rock climbing with my friends. And I never have done this before. They're all good. They go all the time. So we went to this indoor place. And, you know, they scurry to the top because they do this all the time. And I get stuck in the middle. I'm I'm petrified. I'm actually afraid. And her friends are like, hey, it's fine. Go back down. You're good. She says, no, no, no. She said, and in that instant, I could hear you in my ear saying, you can do anything for two minutes. 
You can do anything for two minutes. She said, so I kept going and I climbed to the top and my friends were amazed. Nobody could believe I did it. But if I wouldn't have come to this place, I probably would have given up. So that's what I try to teach them, right? Like the workout is 45 minutes of your day. It's not much of the day. The real work starts when you walk out that front door and you have to confront your life head on. Hopefully you've heard something in this space or you've seen yourself try something you've never done before, a Turkish get up, a pull up for a lot of people. I mean, you, you work in fitness. A lot of people can't even do a pull up. Mm-hmm. So the first time someone does a pull up or a box jump, like their whole demeanor changes. Right. So that's what I try to teach them. Like, just fight for it. Don't give up until you at least fight for it. Right. So I, I have probably a million examples outside of our gym of how what we are teaching people is translating into their real life. And that's the thing that's most rewarding to me, honestly. Yeah, that's that's powerful, um, man. So it, it ended up getting um, <clears throat> a movie done about this. And was it about... Like, what did they approach you? Was it about just your whole story, or did they come to you? And was it was it centered on your gym? Like, how did the, how did it even come to to play? Because that, that's uh that's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah. So, um, the film is called Beautifully Savage, and the film is about a small part of my journey of when I got sent away, and then when I came home, and how I put my life back together. Um, it's called beautifully savage cause that's the name of my gym, but it's also just something that I say. And so, um, the film was made by Lululemon and Huckberry and we did it last December. We shot 44 hours for eight minutes and five seconds of movie. Mm-hmm. And it came about, um, and, and hopefully your listeners can take away from this. It came about from me showing up and I'll explain. I was not quite yet a Lululemon ambassador when I was asked to host a class for seven women that were coming into town that were store managers from the Rocky Mountain region. I said, absolutely, I'll do it. No problem. You know, I just I want people to experience this. I want people in class. (laughs) And so um, I host the class and there was a woman in that class who was a store manager at the time named Ashley Scarpelli. Nobody in that room knew that a year later, Ashley Scarpelli was going to be put in a different position at Lululemon called Men's Community Lead for the Pacific Northwest. But she was. Now, the Men's Community Leads, they go out and they put together, obviously, men's events, but they also form partnerships with other cool brands to help increase the public awareness, especially on the male side of Lululemon as a brand. Um, for if, if, you're, if your listeners don't know, Lululemon is, to me, the premier athleisure line on the planet, but the clothes also perform at a high level. Like So it's the best of the best. Ashley becomes the men's community lead. And then I get an email saying, Hey, Joe, we are going to do a photo shoot and we want you to be the subject of it. It's a call the field guide from this men's website called Huckberry. Huckberry are the best storytellers online in terms of curating men's products, creating cool events and excursions to test out men's products. And so Lululemon and Huckberry partnered to increase Lululemon's, you know, male audience through the amazing storytelling of Huckberry. Well, at the same time, Huckberry, and again, everything lines up, right? When you're doing the work you're supposed to do, when you're in alignment, everything will line up for you if you're open to it. At the same time, Huckberry had just signed a deal to do four films with Breakwater Studios. So when Breakwater Studios calls and says, hey, we should do another film, the Huckberry guys say, I think we found something really cool in Colorado. We're going to send it to you. Tell us what you think. They send some podcast stuff, my newspaper articles, a couple different things. And the Breakwater Studios guys say, we absolutely have to be the people to tell this man's story. So on a conference call, a Zoom call that I thought was about a photo shoot, last year, roughly this time, I was told that we were making a film. And uh, I was going to be the subject of that film. And so 
December 6th of last year, we shot the film and then we premiered it in, well, online, Lululemon Huckberry premiered it online. And then we did showings in New York City, San Francisco, and then finally culminating here in my hometown of Fort Collins. Um, we showed it to hundreds of people and the film has done exactly what I hoped it would do. I didn't want to be a part of a film to edify myself or to be like, hey, look at everything I went through. Oh, I'm so special, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I wanted people to see the film and say, okay, I can keep going. I'm going to keep fighting. And maybe that's a husband and wife who are going to give their relationship another shot. Maybe it's a man who looks in the mirror and doesn't recognize the guy he was 50 pounds ago. Maybe it's a woman whose husband just left her and she's trying to figure out how she's going to do it on her own with two kids. Like, I don't care who it is. This, those are extreme examples, but they're examples that happen every day. I want people to watch that video and say, okay, I can do it. Right. And I've gotten messages from people. I got a message from a guy in Ghana in Africa who literally said to me, I watch this video every single morning when I wake up. And I just thought, man, how powerful is that to be able to share your story authentically and openly and be able to impact people. And I'll finish with this because you said something earlier. You said, I see you and I never would have guessed you were in that situation. That's the other big part of my mission is to change the narrative, the lens around what an ex-offender or an ex-homeless person looks like, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe because somebody sees me or talks to me, maybe the next time someone comes in to fill out a job application and they say, yeah, I got in trouble, the person who would normally not give them an opportunity would say, well, wait, but what if, what if this is another person like Joe Buckner? What if this is another person so hungry to change their life that they're going to give us double the effort of anybody else? What if someone at... A corporation that doesn't hire felons sees my film and says, hey, maybe we should take a second look at this. Maybe we should give more people an opportunity. So that's my other big mission is to use that story, that film, that narrative to change how people see people who have been through the things that I've been through. Man, that is so powerful. So where, where do we uh, watch that online? How do we see that? Um, film? It's on the Lululemon YouTube channel. Um, it's on Vimeo under Breakwater Studios Vimeo channel. Um, but yeah, if you just go on YouTube, you can just type in my name. It'll pop up Joe Buckner or you can type in Beautifully Savage and it'll pop up. So um, yeah, or on Vimeo, same thing. But yeah, the, that film, I was humbled that they chose me because I, I know that I was Lululemon's first choice, but I necessarily might not have been Huckberries in terms of like they just didn't know who I was, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just, yeah, honored and humbled that that Lululemon saw me for who I really, truly am. And, uh, oh, man, I just almost started crying. Um, and not the person that I was in the past and the things that I did. So, yeah. And, yeah, and I've seen it, and it's very moving. Um, I mean, even, even this conversation doesn't do your story justice. I mean – you know, because I've seen quite a bit of your content, I, feel, I think like I understand it a little more. Um, so I, yeah. I, I, I would encourage, you know, anyone listening, regardless if you're in a good place in your life or not, um, it's a, it's a phenomenal story. And, and <clears throat> a lot of guys in this community aren't living the life that they should be. Um, and that's something, you know, fitness aside, I have a lot of passion for um, because – you know, so many people are just grinding it out. And, and I actually get quite a few questions about, hey, Steve, you know, I, I don't like my job. I feel stuck. I want to pursue my passion. And I see that you have, you left a career in finance and, you know, you had plenty of money, but you didn't like the work and you decided to put passion and purpose in front of a paycheck. <clears throat> I want to do the same, you know, can you, you know, talk to me about that? And, you know, you have obviously a lot of experience with that. And <clears throat> I'd be curious to hear, you know, maybe just, what you would tell the guy that's, you know, 44 years old, he's got, you know, three or four kids, he's, he's got a nice job making good money with benefits and, but he's not happy. He's miserable and he wants to desperately wants to do something else with his life and feel a sense of passion, you know, wake up every morning like you do and be like, you know what, 
I'm so fortunate I get to do this every day instead of I have to go to work. I have to spend two hours in the car. I have to sit in front of a computer all day doing shit I don't want to do. Yeah. What can you tell that guy about making a change? Yeah, I love that you did that because if you wouldn't have done that, you and I might not have had the chance to have this conversation. So I, I applaud your courage for doing that. And, you know, it's worked out well for you. Um, what would I tell that guy? I would tell that guy that his kids don't need any more toys. They need a happy father. Um, I would tell that guy that children do what they see and their little eyes are on him every single day. So if they see him frustrated, angry, not happy about his life, then they're just going to assume that that's how life is supposed to be. I would tell him that the man upstairs, if that's what you believe in, um, that's what I believe in, but I'm not telling you you have to, but For me, the man upstairs decides when we come in and when we go out, everything else in the middle is up to us and the pen is always in your hand. So why not write yourself as the hero of your own story? You'll rush to the movie theater to watch Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, the Hulk, right? Cheer for these heroes, but you won't make yourself the hero of your own story, your family's story. That's heartbreaking to me. And yeah, there's got to be fear behind it. But every great thing lies on the other side of fear, right? So... What's the worst that could happen? So for me, I had that. I was homeless three years prior to starting my business. I left one of those jobs people want, six figures a year, two free trips to Mexico, big house, nice cars. I left that to chase after this thing, right? But I wasn't afraid. When I sat down with my girl at the time who broke up with me when I made the decision, just so you know, She ended up coming back a few weeks later, but she broke up with me because she was like, I'm not going through this again. You were homeless when I met you. Now you want to start a business and walk away from your job? I would tell that man, what's the worst that could happen? If you fail, at least you tried, right? Mm -hmm. At least you tried. I used to tell myself every day, worst thing that happens is I go back to work. I can get a job tomorrow if I need to. So, okay, if the worst thing that happens is I go back to a job that pays me $100,000 a year, okay, I'll be fine. But the worst thing that could have happened for me was never trying. And just to give you some context, I got offered a hundred thousand dollar a year job again during this time that I've been building my gym and struggling financially at times. And, you know, like I got offered a, a, a lifeboat. And I remember sitting down with that gentleman. His name was Jim. And I said, Jim, I really appreciate your offer. But I don't want to work for you. I want to be you. I want to own my own business. I want to give opportunities to other people. I want to create something that adds value in my community. But I also added in the the back end. I said, but if I fail miserably, I'll come take whatever job you have. (laughs) I don't care what it pays. I'll come take whatever (laughs) job you have. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not too proud to say that if if, if it all went to crap, I'd go back to work. But I would just tell that man to not be afraid. His kids deserve to see him. His wife deserves to see him take a chance on himself. Because what that also does is it gives them the courage, right? My daughter owns a business, you know. My daughter has her very own um, Waldorf daycare. My son is developing an app, right? He's he's well, he's working at a place called Madwire Media. He's learning everything about digital marketing and retargeting. And but his goal is to be an entrepreneur. Like I'm planting these seeds into my children to be business builders, to create the life that they want. So that's what that man will do if he takes a chance on himself. He will give his family, his friends, courage to do the same thing. Yeah, and it's. Interesting you said that because, you know, and I haven't, we didn't talk about this at all. So that conversation about, you know, your, your kids deserve a happier father. That's the exact conversation that I had with a friend of mine years ago when I was in my worst possible place after my separation, I was away from my girls. I was a mess. I was, I was crying myself to sleep every night. Um, and, and she looked at me in the face and said, your kids need a better father. Like you, you just, you're not being a good father, get your shit together. And she laid it out. And that's, that was the catalyst too, um, for, for what made me say, you know what? She's absolutely right. You know, I, I, I'm not being present for my kids because I'm, I'm eating McDonald's three times a day and I'm drinking three Red Bulls a day and I feel like crap all the time. And when I see them on the weekends, 
you know, I don't want to do anything because I'm tired. I'm just worn out. Yeah. They need better. And that's actually within six months, I had completely changed my life physically, emotionally, mentally. And then we saw each other again. And this was, um, and she said, oh my God, you're, you're, you're not even the same man. And we started dating. And that's the woman I'm with now. She saw this change wow. in me. Love it. Yeah, it was just, it was crazy. I mean, crazy. I love it. And so it's been, it's been phenomenal, but yeah. Yeah, that, that's peace, such a, such a great point, though. Everybody listening, you know, if you're not living the life you want to be living, you know, your kids, yeah, they they need someone to look at and say, okay, my dad loves his life, or he, you know, he has a great marriage with mom, and you know, that's what that's what they need, and they're going to be learning from us, and so yeah, we owe, we owe it to us ourselves and for them, you know, to be. Uh, uh, happier i mean it's 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 crazy yeah and like if i could follow that up too like just this something that i say a lot because it really really matters like there's this saying that well you have to make sure your cup is full before you can pour into anyone else's cup and like i understand what they're saying but once your cup is full the minute you pour out of it it's not full anymore right Mm -hmm. So I believe that we have to make sure that our cup is overflowing because when my cup is overflowing, then I can pour into my family, my job, my friends. Like then I can really, really love at a high level and love big because that's what it all comes down to. Right. Like we love Mm -hmm. big, our family, our friends, like the world that we're in. So if my cup is overflowing, then I can pour from my saucer without ever taking from me. But if I'm unhappy and sad every day and my cup is empty I can't really give my best to anybody. So everybody's getting a half-assed version of me and that sucks. Well said. That's exactly right. I had never really thought about it that way, but yeah, I mean, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, This has been, this has been awesome, man. Um, And I really want people listening to find your stuff. I want them to watch your stuff um, because your message is, it's so deep, so powerful. So, where can I direct people to find more about you? Yeah. First off, thank you for your understanding and, and being patient and making this happen. Um, I, I really appreciate you for that. Sure. If people want more of me, my Instagram is Mr. Joe Buckner. Um, my website is Mr. Joe Buckner dot com. I have um, YouTube under the same name, Twitter under the same name, Facebook under the same name, but I'm most active on Instagram, just going to be real, mm-hmm. um, trying to work more on the other stuff, but it just seems like there's only one of me and a lot of <laughs> platforms that I'm yes, supposed to be yes. on. So um, yeah, connect with me on Instagram, send me a DM, let me know you heard this. I respond to every single message pretty much in real time. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. I think people deserve that when they you know shoot you something, like they deserve a response. Mm-hmm. And so um, I just love to connect with as many people as possible and do my part to help you continue doing the great work that you're doing. And you know, speaking into this community that I feel sometimes gets forgotten. Yeah. Awesome, man. And you know, I used to live in Colorado. Um, one of my, actually my favorite place that I've ever lived. And I've lived in like probably 25 different apartments over the whole country. Boulder, Colorado. I know that's, it's not, you know, right next to Fort Collins, but it's not terribly far. That love, I love that part of the part of the country. Um, Beautiful. And my goal is to get back there someday and I may end up there pretty soon, at least for a, a trip. And I, mean, I just love to connect and, and actually I'd love to come into the gym and get yeah. my ass handed to me a few times, you know, yeah. Say <laughs> punch me in the face a couple of times. <laughs> uh, well, we don't have insurance for punching people <laughs> in the face, but <laughs> yeah, definitely come, come by, man. It'd be great to connect in real life and just uh, vibe out with another cool dude doing good work. Yeah, man. Sounds good. I really, really appreciate this and uh, looking forward to staying in touch. For sure. Thank you so much. I appreciate you wanting me on your show. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Joe. All right. Peace. Thanks for joining us. And remember, if you want more information, check out the Fit Dad Basecamp group on Facebook. And don't forget to stop by fitdadnation.com. Until next time, keep kicking ass and taking the next step. You can do this, Dad.